Hello. We are queued. <clears throat> Oops. Can you hear us both? Yeah. yeah. Hello, I'm Daniel Handler, an author. <laughs> and I'm Lisa Brown, an illustrator. We are a partnership, both romantic and professional, and even romantically professional, <laughs> although not professionally romantic. <laughs> because we get along so well, it's safe to say we have similar aesthetics. So we're able to give each other advice and support on each other's work. Besides that type of collaboration, we've also collaborated on a couple of books, including The Latka Who Couldn't Stop Screaming, A Christmas Story. And How to Dress for Every Occasion by the Pope. There seems to be a theme here, which I wasn't really <laughs> aware of. Oh, yeah, the theme is religion. That just occurred to us. Let's talk about it later. <laughs> um, so um, we uh, uh, were instructed to say something here about our own creative process. And um, our own creative process began when we were very young. And uh, we tried to reach out and learn from the creative processes of authors we admired by contacting them and trying to steal their work. So uh, the author I most admired as a child was Maurice Sendak, oddly enough. <laughs> and uh, so I expressed my interest by writing him a, just a big old fan letter and sending it off and being very, very nervous and waiting for months and four years and never getting a response. So uh, we think this is what happened. <laughs> That's uh, just a dramatization. It does say, uh, <laughs> You are my favorite, Arthur. Please write me back. Your books, I love your books the most, better than Good Night Moon. <laughs> your friend, Lisa. <clears throat> I, meanwhile, uh, tried to contact Edward Gorey. Um, I was older than Lisa was at the time and had just, uh, the first two volumes in a series of unfortunate events had been published and so I sent them to Edward Gorey with a note saying how much I had always admired his work and how much I hoped that he uh, would forgive all that I had stolen from him. And uh, I never heard from him, but a few weeks later, he dropped dead. <laughs> That's also a dramatization. <laughs> um, so I like to think that I killed him. Uh, but we're not here to talk about Maurice Sendak and we're not here to talk about Edward Gorey. What we're here to talk about is American chickens. Um, we thought you could get in on the ground floor of our creative process by uh, talking about our first collaboration, which was this magazine, American Chickens. Um, we're going to uh, prevent. Uh, we're going to present how we started on American Chickens through a short dramatization. So. You this is our creative process in action. Uh, here's a picture of downtown San Francisco where I was temping um, in the early 90s at an accountant's firm. And the name of the accountant was Lewis Handler. And uh, the coincidence is not incidental. It was my father. Yeah. And here's a picture of the City College of San Francisco where I was working as a secretary for the computer science department. Uh, the name of one of the deans at the City College of San Francisco was Sandra Handler, my mother. <laughs> so one day I was at my job and I called Lisa at her job and we're going to reenact that now. Hello, Lisa, love of my life, who will someday be my wife and bear my child. Yes, Daniel. Take a piece of paper. Okay. Fold it in half. Okay. Fold it in half again. Okay. Fold it in half again. Okay. See how it looks like a magazine? 
sort of. It's our magazine, American Chickens, with an exclamation mark. Can our first issue be about Julian Sands? Yes, get to work. <laughs> so uh, this is how we conceived and would create the magazine. You would take a piece of paper, fold it in half again and again until you had a four-page magazine with a fold-out poster inside. That was very small. Um, Vanity Fair won't teach you this. <laughs> but it was very economical because you could um, do it all on one side of a black and white Xerox piece of paper. You're going to show them? Yeah. My slide wasn't sufficient. You know what? We don't have to argue in front of all these people. <laughs> so the magazine basically looked like this. Um, it was very easy to distribute in cafes and uh, bookstores. And by distribute, we just mean leave there. Um, and another part of the creative process involved drinking cocktails. Yeah. And uh, that's where we drank them. That's the Orbit Room in San Francisco, which happens to be next to our laundromat that we went to. We would do our laundry at the Hollywood laundromat and then we would go next door to the Orbit Room and order cocktails and then each week feigning ignorance that we were not allowed to take them into the laundromat, <laughs> we would take them into the laundromat <laughs> and have our editorial meetings there. Uh, yeah, this is our production office. <laughs> it was at the Kinko's across the street. It's harder to do this than it looks when you've had a couple of cocktails. Okay, now we'll go through the elements that made up a typical issue of American Chickens magazine. Uh, so this is the general on the first page would be an editorial. This is from issue number seven, Yahoo for I Do, which was dedicated to weddings. Uh, as you can see, it was released in September 1994. Um, can everyone read that? I'll just read it out loud. This was our editorial. Calling all lovebirds. Want to have that fairy tale wedding you've always dreamed of? We at AC, that stood for American Chickens, offer a few surefire pointers. And these were all the fairy tale theme weddings. Snow White, all bra bridesmaids and ushers must be less than four foot one. <laughs> Sleeping Beauty, take three Valium half an hour before ceremony. <laughs> Little Red Riding Hood, two layer wolf grandma gown, eat spouse. <laughs> Hansel and Gretel, the happy couple walks hands in hand down an aisle of breadcrumbs. The priest or rabbi is shoved into a waiting oven. <laughs> it was only later that we realized that shoving a rabbi into a waiting oven perhaps was a darker joke than we'd had in mind. <laughs> so you didn't get it until I pointed it out, but then when I pointed it out, you're offended at the joke that was made? Wow. I love San Francisco. Um, <laughs> Beauty and the Beast, somebody's ugly. Uh, this was the interior of the magazine in which we often had uh, poetry and quizzes. And so this is part of our issue um, that we entitled A Minute Salute. And uh, so it was all about small things. So we had some very small poetry, which were short. Moon song, full, it glowed round my heart. Suspicion, whose shoe is this? <laughs> Pin. I took a pin and put it in. Fernald or the beaver. Oh, to live. You memorized that one. Yeah. Um, and then there's a little don't forget our fold out poster, which we'll was inside. We'll show you the fold out poster in a minute. Okay. And then the quiz is uh, how to figure out if you are very small. And you give yourself a point for each statement you mark true. One, I trip on lint. <laughs> Two, sometimes I need a little boost. Three, I can swim in an ashtray. Four, I identify with Napoleon, I'm not French. Five, I have to stop, shop in the petite department. Six, I need to use a really small toothbrush. Seven, my blanket is a cocktail napkin. I just realized how that brings back to the cocktail thing. Eight, I need to bring a booster seat to the opera. And then the scoring is zero to three points big, four to six points small, seven to eight points very small, nine or more points cheater. 
All right, so we're not forgetting our posters. No, we're not. The posters were the best part because they displayed the artistic talent of my charming wife, then girlfriend, Lisa Brown. Um, but they're also the hardest part because you would write it up and say, okay, now draw something intricate. And it would take me some time and you'd say, is it done yet? Is it done yet? Is it done yet? And uh, that's really how we did the books too. Yeah. yeah. So this, this one was um, from uh, Sorry Party. It was an ode to the game of Sorry. And there were alternate Sorry cards that you could cut out and put in the deck. So that's automatic win. And that sucks for you, which is must take two men from start, place in any square that is occupied by an opponent, <laughs> and then throw that opponent's men out the window. Um, and then we had extra room, so Lisa made this uh, answer card of a Trivial Pursuit one. And the answers are Dick Van Dyke, The Scarecrow and Mrs. King, Visigoths, It's a Hard Knock Life, They Are All Fluids, and Pele. That's the only uh, sports figure we <laughs> Yeah, knew. it was the only athlete we could come up with. And then uh, there was always the ch who we called the chicken lady up there, and she, she always wore, wore uh, pearls. She was very... Uh, prim and proper. She was like having a, a celebrity endorsement, except she was not a celebrity. We just made her up. So the other next poster. Oh yeah, this is my favorite one. This is from the Dream Come True with Tyria, which is from our issue on lunch. Um, <laughs> so we were really into the suffix Atiria, which I think is underutilized, being as it's really basically in front of calf to make cafeteria, or sometimes carpet to make carpeteria. But it should be used, you know, there should be a, a museateria should be the name of this neighborhood, for instance, because it has several museums in it. Um, so you can see all of the wonderful items for display here. The mashed potatoes in the shape of the busts of famous composers was our favorite one. And um, a watermelon boat shaped like Noah's Ark with two pieces of every kind of meat inside. <laughs> Uh, dessert was candy corn, yeah. and I think there was also candy corn as vegetable. Candy corn's still my favorite vegetable, I think. And Fresca was in mm. the drinks machine. Yeah. And it's free. It's free. It was totally free. Uh, and so then the back, you know, of the issue was always a contest. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This was a raffle. It was always a raffle or a contest. It had audience participation. And so that was your coupon you could mail in to win a free date with Julian Sands. Our first issue was dedicated to the then not very well-known, now entirely unknown British actor Julian Sands. Um, and that's the address, not where we lived. It was my parents' address. Um, in fact, it's still my parents' address. And the, cost, the contest is still open. So... <laughs> If you want to just write that down. First prize was Date with Julian Sands, but the second prize was uh, Steppenwolf, the book, the novel. Yeah, because we had a copy of that and I didn't like it. And so we thought we, chances of getting Julian Sands to actually go on a date with somebody was slim, so we could just give away the second prize because it was a book right there. Uh, and it says the next issue is oral hygiene, uh, which is true. It's true. Yeah. Um, now, unlike our attempts to contact the people we were interested in, uh, the people who were interested in our work in American Chickens contacted us, and we replied for the most part. Um, so this is, oh yeah, this is a real cranky letter we got. I don't know why you blocked out the address being it's, it's in the prior slide, but <laughs> for those of you who are slow getting out your pens, too late, ha ha! Um, so we got a lot of crit critiques about our spelling. Um, that we had misspelled cemetery and minuscule. I still misspell cemetery all the time, and then my um, uh, spell check program on my computer did that thing where it learned it wrong. <laughs> so now it's stopped being a spell check, and it's more like just asking someone at the next bar stool over, like, how do you spell cemetery? I don't know, it looks right. Um, oh, right, this was a big, long letter. Um, and the only reason that we put it in the slideshow is that you might see, say that we, uh, on our masthead, we had that the head of the circulation department's name was Lemony Snicket, which was a name that at the time I was using for such nonsense and uh, soon used for more nonsense. And uh, 
the last letter was if you were really interested in American chickens, you could subscribe. And what to do to describe you, there was plan A, one issue for one stamp. Uh, plan B was two issues for two stamps. And three was three issues for only three stamps. And, um, Which was the best deal. It was the best deal. And so you would send us these uh, self-addressed stamped envelopes, and we would send you issues of American chickens. And so uh, you can see how good we are at responding, because I still had all of the self-addressed stamped envelopes <laughs> in my files. And, and from the, your brother, from Eric, brother. we might add. When he was at the University of Massachusetts. It was a while ago. I just noticed that. He was at school. Yeah. Um, and so, in conclusion, we feel that our creative process is much like that of Maurice Sendak, whose exhibit is across the hall. Thank you very much. Next up, Jonathan Keats. This is my uh, latest book, The Book of the Unknown, and it doesn't have any pictures in it, so I didn't do any sort of presentation. I thought I would just read some of those words to you, um, the first part of one of the stories, which is called Yod the Inhuman. When the scholar Meyer lost his wife of 20 years, he did not hire the town matchmaker to find him another. Instead, he collected mud from the bed of a river, hauled it home, and sculpted it into a girl on the floor of his cellar. Meyer had studied anatomy and worked every muscle and sinew into the cold clay more accurately than had ever been achieved in a statue. He'd also studied art and slimmed the girl's waist narrower and opened her eyes wider than had ever been accomplished by nature. Into each empty socket, he set a star sapphire, then he pricked his finger and drew with his blood the cipher for life that he'd once seen inscribed in an ancient holy book. The figure began to breathe. In the candlelight, he saw that her skin was tawny like the clay and her hair was darkest umber. Yet when he beckoned her, he felt nothing loamy to her touch. By morning, she was his mistress. Meyer gave her his wife's old clothes to wear and the dead woman's wooden brush so that the girl might keep the sign on her forehead, that enchanting birthmark, always hidden beneath her hairline. He also gave his mistress a name by which to obey him. He called her Yod. In almost every respect, Yod was an improvement over Meyer's wife, with whom he'd fought constantly since the day their marriage was arranged. Henya had come from a family with servants, and she'd had no wish to become one herself, but her husband hadn't accepted a position in her father's business as expected. He'd kept to his scholarship rather than becoming a shipping clerk, and her whole dowry spent on inexplicable books, she'd been left to cook the meals and mop the floors. That, at least, had been her point of view. In Meyer's opinion, his wife had performed every task inadequately, squandering the pennies he made as a scribe and translator, money earned at the expense of his studies, on flour she could have milled and meat she could have butchered or wood she could have timbered with her own two hands. When she had reminded him that she was a cripple, club-footed since birth, he would retorted that she hidden that well enough while she was in the market for a husband so it couldn't be too serious an affliction. Naturally, there were no such faults with Yod, who did what Meyer asked of her instantly without thinking to quibble. Because she hadn't any needs of her own, all work was the same, and she tirelessly keep at it until told to stop. In his house, his rule was absolute, and within those four walls he faced the predicament of princes. The totality of Yod's subservience demanded that he know exactly what he wanted. With practice, he got good at that, and his satisfaction with her would have been complete were it not for the least expected of flaws. Meyer had trouble taking pleasure in his mistress. With her club foot and hairy chin, his wife had not especially attracted him, nor had his bow-legged scholar's body and urine blonde froth of beard particularly moved her erotically, yet when they'd gotten down to it, shared hatred had inflamed them, and they'd fought their way to ecstasy. Meyer had none of that with Yod. In bed, she let him do to her whatever he wished. She consented without, 
without comment to acts he never had contemplated with Henya and granted without complaint every favor he asked of her. She was as selfless at copulation as she was at cooking and mopping. But the more of his expectations she met, the less satisfied he felt. Every night, before he put her to rest by rubbing the mark of life from her forehead, he gazed at her wide sapphire eyes and tight tawny waist and wondered what could possibly be wanting. And every morning, when he pricked his finger and reinscribed the vital sign on her still clay figure, he pondered how she could conceivably not fulfill his desires. Because Meyer no longer took work as a scribe or translator, and Yod fetched his wood and water, he seldom spoke to other people anymore. But he did have one old acquaintance. He and the village rabbi, Zelig, had once been schoolmates. They were as different as two men could be. Plump and gregarious, the rabbi had a biblically large family that crowded his home and defined his life as fully as Myers was informed by his library. That Zelig had no books didn't concern folks. At school, he would have flunked without Meyer's Talmudic expertise, yet here he was town McGeed, while Meyer was ignored because Zelig was blessed with common sense. He received Meyer with a ripe kiss on each cheek and a deracinating embrace while unwashed grandchildren clutched at the fringes of the scholar's gown. He offered Meyer tea and, when his guest demurred, proposed a walk along the river. He ushered the scholar through a thicket of untended garden out into the open. They traveled in silence along the river through Crofton Meadow until at last the rabbi asked whether Meyer intended to marry the golem he'd made. What makes you call Yoda golem? asked Meyer. Because she is one, the rabbi said. A girl like that doesn't just appear on her own. In town, they're calling you a sorcerer. Then others know about her, Meyer asked. Did you tell them? They told me, Meyer. They saw a stranger with star sapphire eyes and tawny skin drew water from a well half her weight to the bucket and watched where she brought it. If you ever left your books for a minute, you'd hear them talking. The men are hoarse with envy. They shouldn't be, said Meyer. She works hard and you see how she looks, but that isn't all a man wants. She isn't a good lover, said the rabbi. What did you expect, Meyer? The girl is made of mud. She follows all my orders, said Meyer. A golem will, said the rabbi. The point is, she can't feel. Meyer hadn't considered that, for psychology was one field that he had not studied. The rabbi wrapped a hand around the scholar's stooped shoulders, content to have solved his problem. He did not mind that Meyer was quiet again as they walked back to town. He took it to mean that the whole vexing golem business had been laid to rest. Yet Meyer's silence was not calm. Zelig hadn't cured his affliction, but merely diagnosed it for him. He declined the rabbi's supper invitation. He extracted himself from Zelig's farewell embrace. As the sun went down, he scurried home to Yod, for he knew what had to be done. That was the night of Yod's first lesson. Meyer began by showing her pain because it seemed less ambiguous than pleasure, more fundamental. In bed, he pinched her flesh. Hurt, he said. Hurt, she repeated, expressionless. He pinched her harder on the neck. Hurt, he said louder. Hurt, she mimicked and smiled. He slapped Yud hard across the mouth. He cursed her stupidity. He flipped her onto her belly, pulled up her dress over her rump, and relieved himself inside her numb slot. As he clutched her head to rub her out, she murmured. The word she exhaled in a voice he'd never before heard was hurt. For several days after that, he ravaged her body with every form of torture he could conjure, bruise, blister, burn, to foster the broadest possible understanding of pain. Then he sought to show her pleasure. At first, she was too tender. She could speak only of hurt, no matter how Meyer handled her. But every hour that he stroked her hair, whispering calm in her ear, she trembled less with terror. She began coming to him between chores, laying her head on his lap, and burbling calm in her contralto sing-song. He gave her kisses, which she learned to yearn. From that came naturally the urge that, in her fervid clutch, he told her was lust, but which she pronounced love. Pleasure changed Yod more than pain. 
She wasn't always obedient anymore. She had her own cravings. When Meyer didn't give her the affection she expected, she sat in a chair and pouted, and if he threatened punishment, she struck first and hit hardest. Every night, he was exhausted by her. Her passion bruised and blistered and burned. In pain, he began to question the wisdom of teaching a golem to feel. But Meyer was too wary to see the rabbi or even to look up the matter in his books. And then one evening, after she'd extracted from him every dribble of desire, he fell asleep without blotting her forehead cipher. Yud had never seen a man dormant. Her master wasn't at all pleasurable like that. After waiting an eternity, perhaps several minutes in duration, for Meyer to revive, she climbed out of bed and opened the door. Outside, the moon was full. Its glow felt like a cool slip over her bare skin. Yod shivered, whispering her words, hurt and calm and love, and gathering them again under her tongue for safekeeping, she stepped out into the night, seeking feeling. The forest was so vast that the demon spoke seven different dialects. Some lived in the trees, sailing on the winds, while others were subterranean and blind. Obviously, their cultures also differed. The largest were beasts of destruction, ground-dwelling brutes who'd fell whole civilizations and foul themselves when they were done. The slightest of them, airborne wisps as gentle as dust, thrived on deception, sweeping society with rumor and prejudice, high on their own delusion. But neither of these demons concerned people much. The workings of natural disaster were too calamitous and of human nature too ubiquitous for folks to address. Theft and rape and murder, on the other hand, were demons of a scale that everybody could grasp. And in many countries bordering on the forest, princes offered a bounty on such evils. Peasants would band together after dark, significantly decreasing the local crime rate, even if no demons were actually caught. Folks learned to season their vigilance with cunning. They set traps and lay in wait. And one night, in a small principality where river met sea, some old peasants made a catch. While not exactly beastly, the creature clearly was no ordinary girl. Sprawled on the ground, stark naked, bleeding where the trap clasped her ankle, she stared at her captors through star sapphire eyes, mouthing the word hurt. The language she spoke was foreign to them. They suspected it might be a hex. They gagged her and bound her in rope. To the palace they dragged her through the dirt. They hollered for their prince. They called for their reward. The prince met them in the courtyard. The farmers tipped their hats as his majesty approached, but they did not lower their voices. Each shouting to be heard over the rest, all of them tried to impress the young royal with how courageous they'd been to capture such a demon. When the prince saw the girl lying at their feet, though, he no longer heard their boasts. He got down on his knees like a commoner to untie her. He broke through the knots with strong hands. The peasants looked on in horror. Did his majesty know the danger of releasing such a fierce beast within the palace gates? She isn't a demon, he said. She came from the forest, they told him. You can be sure she is one. Look at her slender waist, he said, her wide eyes. She's probably an abducted princess. A girl like this could be taken up by the devil himself. She shivered. The prince wrapped his own velveteen robe around her bare shoulders. He asked her where she came from. When she didn't respond, he surmised that she must be an exotic princess indeed and led her to his chambers to investigate further. The peasants demanded their bounty. The prince replied that if anyone ever again called her unnatural, their reward would be the gallows. The next day, his majesty announced that he was marrying her. His courtiers, many of them old enough to remember the day his father married his noble mother, and most of whose daughters had been his mistresses on the base of princely promises, wanted to see her credentials. They asked from what court she'd been abducted. Touching her tawny skin, he deemed her pedigree Arabian or African. They demanded to know her name. Turning his royal back, she said, turning his royal back, he said that they could address her as Your Majesty when they met her the following morning at his wedding. Yod, of course, had never before been bathed in rose water. She'd never had her hair woven into a hundred sinuous braids laced with strands of seed pearl. She'd never before been stitched into a gown of fresh magnolia petals embroidered with pollinated thread. Yet almost every incident in her brief life had been unprecedented. She hadn't the experience to no surprise. As the prince set her with his finest gems, clusters of diamonds around her neck, crystal crown upon her head, he was reassured that he'd chosen his wife well. 
To carry such magnificence so lightly, he surmised, her gentle blood must flow back unobstructed to the Garden of Eden. Watching her saunter down the palace steps in slippers of gold leaf, even his haughtiest courtiers laid their nobility humbly at her feet in deepest bows and curtsies. They all listened as the prince exchanged vows with his betrothed. You would pronounce her words precisely as he taught her. She didn't yet know what they meant, but when she kissed him, her lips expressed perfectly how she felt. For many months after that, the prince wasn't seen except with his princess. They shared his throne and together wielded her, his scepter, for their fingers were always entwined. The arrangement suited his subjects, considering them no different from himself. The princess embraced their concerns with trusting fervor. They adored her openly, honoring her with garlands of fresh flowers each day, and every night behind closed doors she quenched her husband's jealousy. And how he sated her, every pleasure that old Meyer had promised, that he urged her to yearn, her young husband provided and desired in kind. In his hands, his wife softened, her tawny skin warmed, her sapphire eyes burned. Yet a golem, even a royal one, lacks human perception. Yod didn't notice, less than a year into her marriage, the flicker in her husband's gaze when he looked at Cartier's newly adolescent daughters, nor did she discern meaning in their giggling when, for misbehavior that mystified her, he called them to the throne for a spanking. Then he decreed that as an anniversary gift, his dear princess would spend a month at his country's famed rejuvenating baths. And I will leave off there. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And please welcome Lisa Clevin. Let's see. Is this good? <laughs> it's a little high. Oh, I guess I can take it off. I'm very low tech, in case you didn't guess. My name is Elisa Clevin, and um, I have a lot of kind of a variety of things to show you this evening. When uh, I might just do my uh, basic school talk, which I've done for lots of children, and I just kind of have to pretend you're third grade and under, and then I feel completely at ease. Um, children often ask me why I create picture books, and why does a grown-up spend her days making up stories and pictures about things like paper dolls who come to life, or lions who paint pictures with their tails, or flying grandmothers, dogs who bake bread, little blue crocodiles. And I guess the answer is that I've never outgrown a very childlike um, habit of making my own little make-believe worlds within the big everyday one. As a, as a kid growing up in LA, I had a strong desire for magic in my life. I think all children have this, but I remember really wishing that um, Peter Pan would fly through my window one night and whisk me off to Neverland, <clears throat> or that Stuart Little would come and teach in my school or I could open a, find a wardrobe door in my house and be in Narnia, or slide down a rabbit hole, or, you know, why did Dorothy's house whisk away to Oz in a cyclone? I thought that was very cool, even though it was terrifying. I just wanted my house to go up in the sky and land in Oz. And, and of course, these things never happened except in books. And I love to read, but whenever I was done with a book, I had an intense sense of frustration and longing because I still wanted the magic to continue. So I ended up making little imaginary worlds of my own, using stuff I'd find around the house. I made a dollhouse in my closet. I made the rooms out of um, fruit crates. And I made the people out of all sorts of stuff. Um, I remember that balcony used to hold my mother's checks from the bank. I was constantly recycling little bits and pieces of things. This little Shabbat dinner the rabbi and his wife are made of um, walnut shells with cotton hair. Uh, the tablecloth is a handkerchief. The challah is a little tiny bit of bread dough that I baked in the toaster oven. Um, I loved the book, The Borrowers, about the little people who furnish their home with bits and pieces of the, the big world. I, never, I always thought that was just so fascinating, and I never looked at a watch or a thimble in quite the same way after seeing them as, you know, glasses for milk or grandfather clocks. And so books like that inspired me a lot. 
Um, I love the little house books, and I felt very jealous of Laura and Mary who got to churn butter, because I got my butter from the plastic tub at the supermarket, and so I made little... I thought they were very wholesome, but now I realize they're kind of odd because they're made of cinnamon sticks and wine corks, my churns. <laughs> and that little lady there baking bread, or I guess she's using a rolling pin to roll out bread. She's just a paper doll. Paper had a kind of magic to me when I was a kid, and it still does because that's what artists do all day and writers. We sit there with paper and pencil and paint trying to give it a life and a spirit of its own. That was my setting. I lived in L.A., I didn't see, you know, rolling hills and big puffy clouds when I looked out the window. But, it, you know, I, my mom was pretty cool. She let me make a whole um, world in this closet. You can see the top of it. And that was a mural I made. So I would go in there and just start pretending. It was kind of like New England meets the shtetl. There's the... <laughs> I, I liked Fiddler on the Roof. And I made my own little Jewish wedding and all sorts of... It's very eclectic, my house. And my books are still... Well, I'll get to that in a minute. When I got to be about 11 or 12, I started to worry about my passion for playing and making dolls. Because on the outside, I was a normal enough, whatever that is, junior high school kid. But at home, I still wanted to make up stories. I would come home and start making little people out of bread dough and naming them and giving them stories or making dolls out of apples. He used to be playing a seed pod mandolin, but it... It fell, but his hands are still playing the imaginary mandolin. And then one day, I, it kind of struck me that there was nothing particularly wrong with me. I just, um, I like to make up stories, and I like to create characters and build little settings and worlds around them. And that's why I think I write and illustrate picture books. I don't play in a dollhouse anymore, but I work in my studio. And I'm still making miniature imaginary worlds inside of my books. A lot of my characters have look like toys, and a lot of my settings have the feeling of a dollhouse with lots of little rooms and windows everywhere. I usually start my, this was um, one of my very early books. It's about 20 years old. <laughs> but I usually start my stories by wondering what if about my characters. This is about a little blue crocodile who wonders what if. His name is Ernst, and he shows up in a lot of my books, including my most recent one that's here tonight, The Carousel Tale. Or what if there were a lion who painted pictures with his tail? What if my grandma and I, Abuela, went flying over New York City? I didn't write the story. An author named Arthur Doros wrote it but I responded to the um, what-if quality of it and the fantasy, and I like mixing imaginary and real places, so obviously it's New York City, but they're flying. So <laughs> that resonated with me. And that's the sketch I make, and that on the right, and the finished picture on the left. This is about a little cat who has a what-if. What if she's so lonely she wishes that the star would jump down from the sky and play with her? What if a little girl made a paper doll and before she could give it hair, it blew away? It's a paper princess. It's a bald princess. <laughs> um, like my, my characters are pretty eclectic. Um, like my dolls used to be. I make characters who are paper dolls or birds or monsters, angels, real kids, apples. And my settings are too. I move around from outer space to dream worlds, real places, that's Brooklyn. That's from my newest book, which Thatcher Hurd wrote, and this will be out in spring. It's called The Weaver. And you can see sort of Bay Area, Yosemite, and The Weaver <laughs> with her magical tapestry. So all this making of stories and settings and characters gives me the same pleasure that I used to get making toy worlds, because I think children and artists share that um, the gift of bringing the inanimate to life with their imagination, taking a doll and a tool or a toy and bringing, um, breathing life into it, making it a character, or taking paper and pencil, and suddenly you have a, a living form. Well, living in terms of art, you know what I mean. <laughs> and the way I make my pictures, I, I do a lot of collage, and it's very similar to the way I played as a kid, too. I take bits and pieces of things I find around the house or material or doilies. Instead of turning it into a dollhouse rug or tablecloth, I snipped it to bits and turned it into a snowstorm. I liked what you said about taking a cocktail napkin and turning it into a blanket. 
because I did a lot of that. And uh, I'll take wool and turn it into my lion's mane. I'm not sure how long I've been talking for, but I'll take five more minutes. Is that okay? Um, sometimes I take origami paper, and in this picture from Abuela, I turn them into sailboats. I also paint and draw my own collage materials, so I'll paint a big piece of starry, you know, red starry pattern and then cut it up into a skirt or a sailboat, as it were, a rainbowy stripes. Take bits of cloth and turn them into curtains, just exactly the way I played as a kid, recycling. And most kids, after I've done the slideshow at school, kids are always saying, I did that in my shoebox, or I make these things. And I just like validating that, because I think it's common to childhood, and I want to keep it alive, because so many kids are scheduled to death and you know don't have time to just sit there and make stuff like I used to. Uh, quickly, I'll talk a little bit about my stories. They're often about transformations, too. In this story, the paper princess, a little girl, takes markers and paper and turns it into a princess. The, and later, the princess turns into a birthday card on her other side and finds her way home to the little girl who first made her. A carousel tale, the little crocodile here, Ernst, he loves the honey-colored dog on the merry-go-round. He rides it every day after school. And one winter day when the merry-go-round is all covered up, he finds the tail on the ground, and he feels quite startled by this sight. And he brings it down to the back to the carousel keeper, who's a kindly elephant. And she says, he can keep it over the winter. He has to take good care of it, and he promises to take good care of it. But it's kind of a depressing sight, especially on his toy shelf with all his toys. And so he turns it into a beautiful new creature. <laughs> beautiful. No. <laughs> it's happy, anyway. And then he makes his friend the dog a new tail in spring. So he didn't forget about the dog, either. He also is a, um, he's a dreamer. And he shows up in the puddle pail, too. He wants to collect things like his big brother, who has very cool collections of rocks and rubber bands and coins. And Ernst wants to collect stars and clouds and rainbows, and his big brother laughs at him and tells him he can't do that. But he finds a way to collect their reflections. I got that idea by looking at the reflections in my neighborhood on a rainy day. They look like shimmery paintings on the ground. And I turned it into Ernst's world. At the top, that's a striped puddle. He's, he collects things like purple puddles and flowered puddles and checkered puddles and striped puddles. And that's the striped puddle I saw. So you never know. Kids say all the time, where do you get your ideas? And I say, I was walking through my neighborhood and I saw a striped puddle. <laughs> or one winter day, I was really grumpy and my kids were screaming to go out and play and I, the sun hadn't shone for weeks, so I made a big round buttery bread. And as I was baking it, the sun came out. And that's where I got my idea for sun bread, which is a story about a dog who makes a bread that's very much like the sun because it's round and golden and it shines and rises and warms everybody up. Those are my dogs. <laughs> I put the things I love in my books, including my kids. There's New York City. I like to, as I said before, I like to illustrate real worlds as well as imaginary lands inside of my head. And that was my grandmother. She was a big inspiration. She came from a little shtetl, and she has a very sad story her family was wiped out. But when she was an old woman, she's a survivor, and when she was an old woman, she started um, sculpting. And she would take a lump of clay and turn it into the people from her village. And I was really, um, I thought that was magical to watch her take clay and turn it into the rabbi or the, the mother and child or the old man and the little boy. And she recreated her whole village. And so that was quite a, a powerful thing to see. That's Picasso. I love how he turned a... Um, bicycle seat into a, a bull. And kids do this all the time. They look at the clouds. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Following Picasso, I turned a merry-go-round, I mean a pie pan. That's a Marie Callender's pie pan on the bottom that I made into a merry-go-round. That was my mother's work. She was an artist. She was an etcher and a printmaker. She used to take junk from rusty old cars and make new animals and shapes out of them. So I had a lot of amazing influences. Um, she made etchings of me and my sisters, a very different style, obviously, from my colorful, whimsical one, but some of the tiny, teeny things I used to make, too. Anyway, so get an overview of where pictures and ideas come from.
Thank you. Please welcome Thatcher Hurd. That's as high as it'll go, I guess. Okay. My little calendar came up on the screen. And I can none of your none of your preferred networks are available. Okay, here we go. There we go. So I grew up in a family of people who did children's books. My mother wrote books. This is her sitting on a Campbell's soup box. And my father was an artist and an illustrator. This is him painting in landscape in Vermont in a bow tie. And this is me drinking in the garden. I don't know what I'm drinking there, but then um, that's my potty chair over to the left. But I was a really chubby kid. Anyway, um, as some of you may know, my, as I said, my mother wrote books, my father illustrated, they did lots of books together, and they also both worked with Margaret Wise Brown. Uh, my father illustrated Goodnight Moon and uh, The Runaway Bunny, among other books of hers, and my mother also did books with her. Um, this is her pushing me in a little uh, cart in the winter. She loved fur. My parents said uh, she died tragically very young at the age of, I think, 42. So I, didn't, I don't remember her, but um, my parents said she would arrive uh, at their house in Vermont in an open convertible in the winter with all fur rugs all around and around her. And then they took me one time when I was um, about two or so to visit her. And she lived in New York, but in the summer she lived in Maine. And um, she had a house on the island of Vinyl Haven that you could only get to by water. And they, she said to my parents, um, we'll just take the ferry from Camden uh, to, to Vinyl Haven, and I'll, I'll sail out and meet the ferry in the middle of Penobscot Bay, and you can just get off onto the sailboat. So my parents got onto the, uh, the ferry, and uh, the ferry, the captain said, no, we don't do that. <laughs> But somehow they convinced him to do it, so they handed me over the side of this ferry into her sailboat, and we sailed to her place. And she, she didn't have kids of her own, and she was one of those people who was amazingly in touch with her own childhood, but she couldn't really relate to real kids. So she had apparently made me this whole dinner, like a little quiche or something. And I was two, and I, didn't, I had no interest in that at all. And then she had made a whole fur room, the bo be bottom of her house. And this was where I was supposed to sleep by myself. <laughs> and she, she, uh, she I, I think she had a tiger rug on the floor. And my parents took me down to, um, to this room and I burst into tears. I wouldn't have anything to do with it. Anyway, and one of my all-time favorite books of hers is The Little Fur Family. If you don't know it, it's that, it's, I think they publish it bigger now, but when it was originally published, it was tiny, and it was covered in real rabbit fur. And they put all the fur in a big, all the books in a big warehouse, and all the fur rotted. <laughs> anyway, this is, this is my parents with Margaret looking very debonair. And again, her, that's, that's, I'm sure that's not a fake fur coat. That's a real. Uh, and you notice my father's got a cigarette. And this is the picture that was on the back of Goodnight Moon for many, many years. Um, he looks sort of like, who's that actor? He was in, uh, I can't remember, 
Ed Harris, that's right, anyway. Um, but he had this cigarette in his hand, and, and it, this was just on the back of Goodnight Moon for years and years. And one day, a few years ago, they, you probably heard this whole thing. They called me up at Harper, and they said, we want to take the cigarette out. And I said, no way. You're not going to do that. But they kept badgering me about this. So finally, I gave in foolishly, and I said, okay, take the cigarette out. So they, if you look closely, you can see I did a little uh, imitation of this. Watch, watch his hand. Go back, <laughs> cigarette, no, cigarette. And it looked just like that. It looked incredibly bizarre to have a man just standing there with this weird hand. <laughs> so this great bookseller, Pete, who runs the Reading Reptile in Kansas City, he's, he, he started this whole campaign to like bring the cigarette back. And he started a whole, <laughs> it was a fantastic website. And he had pictures. He compared this to Stalin, you know, the way Stalin Used to, used to paint out his people he liquidated, and he had a whole website comparing this, taking the cigarette out to Stalin. And then he started a, uh, he started a, um, uh, a poll to ask people whether they thought the cigarette should be out or not. And it was a huge deal. I mean, people got really exercised about it. But then he discovered that people had learned how to hack into his website, and it was like 10,000 votes skewed the wrong way or something like that. Anyway, but it got all the way to, somebody sent this <laughs> the Tokyo newspaper, or ja I think that's Japanese. Is that Japanese? Yeah, yeah. So it was cool to see my dad in Japan. Anyway, so I grew up in a whole kind of wonderful world of people who did children's books. This was a very dear friend of ours was Don Freeman, who wrote Corduroy and other terrific books, Norman the Dorman and Pet of the Met, which I loved. This is him with his lovely wife, Lydia. And uh, actually, this I found this picture among my parents' stuff. This is Maurice Sendak with my parents in like 1963 or something like that. And as long as we're on the cigarette theme, there's Maurice, there's Maurice lighting up on our deck. And I think that's Don Freeman over in the corner. Um, And my, Margaret, well, we called her, they called her Brownie, but anyway, my, she, had a, she loved terriers, and she had a terrier, and she and my mother decided to call the dog nothing to, to see what psychological effect it would have. <laughs> so so uh, I found this, this wonderful old photo album of my parents' things, and you can see down the bottom it says, Nothing and brownie. Uh, her, my, I think the, I, I will, the, the greatest children's book ever written, I think, is Sailor Dog. And I completely adored this book when I was a child. And there was something about the adventure and the coziness and the wonderfulness of it that captivated me. It has pictures, it's by Margaret Wise Brown, it has pictures by Garth Williams. So when I started doing children's books, I was kind of dazzled and overwhelmed by my parents' careers and the people they knew. So I sort of definitely started out in that vein. And I, Sailor Dog starts out, born at sea in the teeth of a howling gale, the sailor was a dog, Scuppers was his name. So I did a book called Hobo Dog. It was one of the first books I did. And Hobo Dog, Hobo Dog starts out, Born in a boxcar rolling west, the drifter was a dog, Hobo was his name. So it took me about 10 years of doing books to start really feeling like I could do my own kind of stuff and not be so overshadowed, I guess, by. And the kind of first book I did that really um, felt like me was Mama Don't Allow, based on the old uh, song. I used to hear the song all the time on the radio and I thought, this has got to be a picture book. But it took me forever to, I don't know, the good ones seem to take a long time. I have to kind of put them away for a long time, take them out, rework, rework. And then I did um, Art Dog. Art Dog started out as a completely different book. It started out as a book about frogs in a pond. It's really true. <laughs> And I would take it out every few months and work on it, and slowly it evolved and evolved and evolved. 
but it never really got any better. And I finally got to a book called Ultra Dog. And I, what I do is I, I write the book, and then I make a little dummy. We call it a dummy. It's just a little version of it. And um, I did this book called Ultra Dog, and then I usually give it to my wife, Olivia. And uh, you know, she reads it, and then she finishes, and then there's like this pause. And how long the pause is, is like how good the book is, kind of. So there was long pause after Ultra Dog. And it, you know, it wasn't really working. She, she said, it's not really working. It wasn't really working. So I put it away again for a long time. And then I was riding along a freeway, driving along a freeway, and all of a sudden I had this thought. It was like, what's ultra backwards? Well, it's Art Lou, but <laughs> I, I took off the Lou part. And I ended up with Art Dog. But it's, it's, it's interesting how a title can really spark a book. I find if I, if I always feel like if I, it's like this little thing. If I get the title, it's going to be right. So there's Art Dog filling up his brushmobile at the Acme Paint Company. I didn't bring a whole lot of pictures from it. And then I would just like to end by uh, reading Bad Frogs. Oh no, there's another Art Dog picture. This is Art Dog painting the bad guys into their own masterpiece which looks suspiciously like a Henry Matisse. I had so much fun doing this book, I didn't show any of the pictures, but I got to take all kinds of famous paintings, um, Picasso and Gainsborough and Vermeer, and turn them into dog paintings. Anyway, this is Bad Frogs. <clears throat> Bad Frogs. Green and slimy. Riding motorcycles, slurping ice cream, making bad noises at the dinner table. Bad frogs, very bad frogs. Bad frogs, smelling yucky, talking crummy, wearing bad hats, wearing dark glasses. Does anybody know what bad hats are? Mm. This is the one that third graders really like. Staying up late, kissing their girlfriends. <laughs> bad frogs, very bad frogs. Bad frogs, riding skateboards, chewing newt gum. Spilling the water out of the bathtub. Bad frogs, very bad frogs. Now here comes the middle part. Could they be good? Could they be quiet? They're trying really hard. Could they dress up in tutus and dance in a straight line? Could they? Oh, would they? No way. Uh, oh, I, I did the wrong page. Wait, hold on. No way. Not a chance. I don't think so. Nope. They'll never say thank you. They'll never say please. They'll never eat broccoli. They'll never, ever eat peas. They'll jump in the muck. They'll fall on their heads. They'll fight with their toothbrushes. They'll fall out of bed. They'll be bad frogs forever. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, um, Maurice Sendak is um, uh, someone who has, even though he doesn't have children, has stayed deeply connected to the world of the children's imagination. Um, and I think as, as writers who write children's books, fables, and so forth, um, I think that's, I would imagine that's something that you all do. Um, I'm wondering, maybe he's going to start with Jonathan. Uh, uh, you wrote this. You wrote this fable. I think you. I think it's called the fable. There's um, 
the there's a book called Yud also, which was kind of where I think that um, that Yud was a book that became part of this. Um, so I'm just wondering, something like a fable is that uh, a kind of a intermediate genre between, let's say, children's literature and adult literature, and um, how, how does that feel to you? I, I think it was a, a failure of imagination on my part as far as what to call these things. I had written a couple novels that were contemporary literary fiction, uh, which should be said, I suppose, with an accent British. Um, and I kind of was feeling like there was something lacking in those, at least for me, and that what was lacking was what I remembered from reading Sendak and others, uh, which was that once upon a time, long ago and far away quality of just telling a story. And so ultimately, I um, abandoned a failed career, if you can do that, as a, an author of contemporary literary fiction to try to write stories that I might want to read. Um, and Yud was one of a series that were shamelessly uh, swiped from Talmudic legend, uh, the uh, the Vav, the 36 Righteous, uh, served as a good frame and also served as a good um, marketing tool, perhaps, in terms of the fact that there were a lot of them, so I could just keep going and it had some inherent structure. And so Yod was, was, was one of these, well, one of what will eventually be 36, or actually it's deceptive, um, deceptive advertising. There are only 12 in this book. I haven't written the other 24. Um, <laughs> but to me, a fable is sort of, it's a it's an act of the imagination, um, the creation of an alternate universe that allows us to reflect back on our own. So I think maybe it is what I thought I was trying to do with a contemporary literary fiction, uh, satirically, I now am trying to do in a different way of how people have been doing it in children's literature and how people were doing it around the campfire for um, thousands, tens of thousands of years. And there's, there's an awful lot of stealing going on in this group, which is great. <laughs> um, Daniel, I wonder as, um, I think you might be the only person on the panel who has kind of written books explicitly, well, I books mostly for kids and mostly for adults. I'm just wondering, um, in your imagination, are uh, do those places, do the, do the inspirations for those different genres of books come from the same place? You probably get this question a lot, but uh, it's something I'd be really curious to know. Um, yeah, I guess they do. It's, I mean, I never know where ideas come from except I either steal other people's ideas or, I, I think that they're always stolen ideas. I just, they're either stolen on purpose, that is, I know absolutely where I stole it and I hope no one notices, or, I think of it myself, and then later I'm rereading something, and I think, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I, but it all feels one and the same to me. The um, I don't, I feel more and more bewildered at the older I get. So the uh, sense that I'm in a world in which things are happening that I don't understand was the essence of childhood, but it seems even more so the essence of adulthood. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, I also, I live here in San I grew up here in San Francisco, and so I live here, so I think that helps reinforce it, that it's all a huge cycle, doing the same thing over and over again. My son just started public school as I went to public schools here in San Francisco, and it's been a l big, long memory of elementary school that I walk him every morning. It's not the same school, but it, but it has the same feel to it, you know, I think, oh yeah, bells, and then everyone's saying, is that the first bell or the second bell? <laughs> you know, it's a terrible way to run anything. <laughs> and no one's fixed it. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was your question? I don't remember, I don't... <laughs> um. I just read this book by Jonathan Ames um, called, um, what's it called? It's his new book. Uh, no, it just, I, I, I think it just came out. I got a, 
Which one? No, it's the very newest one. I'll remember it um, at the end of my long and embarrassing introduction to my question. But anyway, someone asked him in the book, where do you get your ideas from? And he says, from my brain. <laughs> Which I thought was actually a really good answer. So you're welcome to use, you're welcome to steal it. If I that. had Jonathan Ames's brain, that's where yeah. I'd get my ideas too. <laughs> Um, freak. <laughs> I mean, in a good way. Mm. Anyone else want to jump in with anything, did Lisa? Did you? you <laughs> I don't have any opinions. Oh, you, Jonathan. I thought Lisa. you were reaching. I no. thought you were reaching for the mic. <laughs> Not at all. No. Um, <laughs> didn't Didn't Dr. Seuss? Dr. Seuss said he, he said somebody asked that question. He said I, I get my ideas from a retired phoenix out in the desert. Mm. <laughs> that That'll work too. <laughs> um. So uh, there's been all this stuff out about um, where the wild things are, the, um, the movie, um, and uh, there's been a lot in the paper. Uh, Spike Jones was on Terry Gross, I think, a few days ago, and there was a cover of the New York Times Magazine was about the film, and um, I think it was in Newsweek where um, Maurice Sendak was uh, interviewed about the film, and he um, said, what do you say to parents who say that the movie is too scary? And he said, tell those parents to go to hell. Um, I've seen the movie and I think it's kind of scary. It is scary. Um, well, not well. I mean, it depends what kind of kid. Too scary for our kid. Um, <laughs> not not uh, not too scary for me. Um, so you could tell my parents to go to hell if you want. I, <laughs> there I had their address up I... there before, so you can just write them. <laughs> I, I guess you know the. Um, the question is, uh, how is children's literature and how is literature supposed to make us feel? Is you know, Bruno Bettelheim has this whole idea about the famous uh, psychoanalyst that you're actually supposed to be kind of terrified and connect with your subconscious fears and longings and so forth. And a lot of children's literature, you think of the Grimm brothers and so forth, is actually explicitly about surfacing some of those fears and so forth. Does there need to be a sense of uh, danger or something in um, a book for kids, or is that useful, or how useful is it? Do any of you feel like it's something that you've included, or I don't know, Elisa, any? Elisa? Elisa. Oh, yeah. I like a character with a problem, just because when I was a kid, I didn't want to read about happy characters. I wanted to read about a princess who was bald, say, maybe that's why I wrote that story for myself. Or, uh, you know, just what's wrong with, I love books like Little Witch, about a little girl who's a witch's child, or The Hundred Dresses, about a little girl who's very poor, and she, I think I was influenced by that. Um, she makes all these pages and pages of uh, dresses. She's and she says she has a hundred dresses. And then the girls tease her because she only wears one little faded blue dress to school every day and they make fun of her. And then at the end of the book, we find out in her closet, she has paintings of dresses that she's made. She's made herself a hundred dresses. And I just, I just loved that. I like that idea. Again, I, I didn't mean to wander, but I think that you know the idea of making your own universe <clears throat> or your own world or your own happiness I like characters who have to do that, whose job it is to, and I think kids resonate with that because they basically don't have any power and they have their art supplies and, you know, maybe they have different gadgets now. I guess they do. Maybe. I shouldn't say that. As a mother of a 13-year-old, I should know better, but yeah, they have lots and lots of more, you know, they don't have to make, maybe they don't have to make as much art as, as they might have to, but. I don't know. I just like the idea of kids, um, you know, somehow making their world whole. And so, in my, I can, just the stories that I was attracted to as a kid have characters that do that, and the kind of stories I find myself writing in spite of my own <laughs> desire to um, not be redundant. I keep making the same kind of characters. Lisa, did you want to add something? Well, I've always felt that um, kids are like people. So some kids <laughs> like scary stories and other kids don't. I was a kid who loved scary stories and the scarier the better, which is why I loved Marie Sendak so much. Um, but my son likes uh, stories about vehicles. <laughs> and I don't like stories about vehicles and I never did. And also Bruno Bettelheim was a child molester, so maybe that's why. <laughs> 
he was promoting the scariness. Right. Um, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I found, I mean, I guess I never really thought about this before, but I found that, I mean, I realized that the books I've done that had a plot and something really suspenseful and scary that might happen to the characters always did better than the books that didn't have that suspense. I mean, it, if I think back, the ones that didn't have any suspense flopped. And the ones that had some suspense did, you know, were, were much, seemed maybe much more popular with kids. I mean, it can be on a whole, all kinds of different levels, but some sense of suspense or mystery or getting scared or something. Or even if they've read, yeah. even if they've read it 26 times, when they get to that page where something scary is about to happen, they still get scared. I mean, it's. Well, I think it's human to want to read a book about imperfect people or animals or characters. Because as an adult, I don't want to read a book about Mrs. Jones' perfect life. I want to read about her problems. And <laughs> when I was in fifth grade, I had this uh, textbook for creative writing called Paragraph Power. <laughs> um, and one of the things that we had to do was write a story about leaves. <laughs> and I just remember thinking and thinking and just thinking that everything was boring about leaves that I could think of. Um, and so I wrote a story about a man and he walked by a tree and it was fall, so the leaves were falling on him and then more and more fell on him and they ate him. <laughs> <laughs> and I was taken to task and given a poor grade <laughs> from Mrs. Perry. <laughs> But, I, but every so often when I'm stuck now writing, I, that comes back to me. I, I think, oh, it's just like that leaf story. <laughs> and so I kind of work on a rewrite of the leaf story, and I can never think of anything better than what I thought of when I was in fifth grade. I can't, what is the, the leaves live in leaf land or something? I can't, I can't think of anything except something really awful happening <laughs> with leaves. Um. Maybe this is a good time to bring in some audience questions. What do you think? <laughs> no, I, I loved your anecdote. <laughs> we'll, we'll just leave it at that. Um, so um, I think I'm going to borrow one mic so we can have one mic going this side and one <laughs> mic going this side. <laughs> Take them all. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I just remember the title of that Jonathan Ames book, The Double Life is Twice as Good. Is it? I think it's out. I haven't read that one, but Jonathan Ames is good. He's good. He's speaking of the. Jason. I feel bad because I called him a freak, but I think people who've read Jonathan Ames know that that's not inaccurate. That's just a factual. <laughs> that's just yeah. Alice Munro is a woman. Jonathan Ames is a freak. Hi, I was wondering. You were talking about the role of danger in the books. I'm also wondering on the flip side the role of morals or lessons in terms of children's books and where you sort of started with that maybe in the beginning of your writing and has it evolved or what your thoughts are about should there be a moral, should there be a lesson and you know how that should play out? No, I, don't, I, I mean, I, no. I <laughs> one of the, one, oh, well, to no. uh, speak of the fables that my colleague, Mr. Keats, writes based on the Talmud, based on old ancient stories, which are invariably called moralistic, when people talk about them and then when you read them have no discernible moral whatsoever. <laughs> you know, God said, sacrifice your son. And then he, he was like, really? And he was like, I, I'm serious. Okay, no, don't do that. <laughs> the moral is, uh, you know, don't, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but he told you to. It doesn't make any sense. So I think that... I always think that a story that feels real, that feels true, doesn't have that, what we think of as a moralistic structure. It often turns out to have certainly much enriching that you can wallow in, but it doesn't have what we think of, which is, oh, we better teach the little nippers something. Um, you know, that there's no, what's the moral of bad frogs? Like, oh, sometimes you're stuck with them, man. There they are. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost disconcerting when you think that, 
you think they're going to behave. Are they going to be good? And you think, oh, this book's getting worse. And then, oh, no, they're not. They're just bad frogs. I was hoping that some reviewer would get upset about the fact that they were completely immoral. And, and the only, I, I, you know, there was a few reviews and PW said they weren't bad enough. <laughs> it was bizarre. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was like it was like it was like what what kids the, the review basically said what kids see on TV isn't half as bad as I mean it's much worse than this, and I was like wait a minute this is for five year olds three year olds plus they're frogs I mean what, plus they're frogs yeah. they can't be as bad as people otherwise you know we'd be endangered living in polluted ponds <laughs> and frogs would be holding seminars. That's the takeaway here. Morals, no. Well, I always think there is, I always think there, is, there are inherent morals in good stories, but that when you're working on them, you work on a good story, and then it turns out to have some kind of moral, but not the kind of moral that you think of when you think of morality. It's subtle. It's Talmudic. I was, I was actually about to say that I think this is what I like about working from Talmudic legend is that um, if there is a if there is a moral, then there is another counter moral, and then there is another contrary to that one, and eventually people are just bored to death by it and will go on with their lives or with the lives that are inside the story. So sometimes I think there is a moral that's sort of starting to worm its way into one of my stories, and then happily I get distracted and it goes Talmudic on me and it's gone. <laughs> any more? Should we have any more questions? I have a question on character development. Do you find in the beginning that you immediately have a character when you start, or with like no idea and evolves as you keep going, or just how that process plays out? Yeah, I usually start mine with a character. My stories, I usually start with a character. And I don't really do this consciously, but as I mentioned before, my characters usually have a problem. They want or a wish. They want something. What do they want? What, what's wrong with them? You know, <laughs> that's basically how I start. Because I want kids to keep turning the pages and wonder what's going to happen to them. with my own character too. <laughs> that ties into what I said before. If I started with a perfect character, that'd be no story. But the characters start to feel sort of like they're living their little lives um, without you. At least that's the way it kind of happens to me. But they do evolve. They don't come all at once in some big, I mean, you kind of, you kind of figure out who they are through the story. You know, you're figuring out at the same time that you're creating it, I think. I always think that character is kind of a bunk notion. Um, that it's really story and that what, what the characters are is what happens to them. Um, and so, and, and what they do in response. And I, because I always think, like I was just thinking of it when you were doing your presentation that you had that woman who was a, a survivor and who was recreating her village out of clay. Oh, was your grandmother that person? That <laughs> some old lady you found? I don't know. <laughs> um, so then, and so just from those tiny pinpoints, you you made up. A, one can make up a character. You didn't make her up, but that you uh, you know. Well, but you could. Uh, I looked at her, and then you saw that she had an interesting expression on her face, and that she just had those tiny incidents, and then. From that, you can infer an entire character, and so whatever, whenever I have, I'm I'm working with, I'm trying to figure out what someone would do, and then I just think we'll have them do something interesting, and then all of a sudden it'll break that door wide open. Um, I am um, I'm just working on a novel now for adults, although it has a bunch of adolescents in it, and um, I decided um, that it would just be more interesting if this the 
the adolescent girl who's in the story lost her best friend, not that the best friend dies, but they have one of those huge fallings out that one sees so much of when one is 14. And, um, and once I decided that would happen at the beginning of the book, that there would be this huge falling out, then all of a sudden I had to decide, well, is she going to be angry about it? Is she going to be upset? Is she going to retreat? Is she going to be aggressive? Is she going to find a new friend and how she's going to find that? And then all of a sudden I had a whole character for her. But it was really a story. It wasn't... Um, it wasn't notes on a character, which I feel sometimes in creative writing classes and things they tell you, you know, you have to come up with, she plays Mahjong, she lisps, you know, and five years ago she worked in a grocery store. And then I think, well, that's boring. But then you think, oh, and then one day the grocery store was attacked by bad frogs. And then you think, well, then she went and got the knives, so she's that kind of woman. I think that I'm always trying to work against character in a way. I mean, that the title of the story that I started to read to you was you know, The Inhuman. And all of these stories, uh, there, there's uh, um, Zion the Profane, there's you know, Aleph the Murderer, um, and so forth. And I think that always what I'm after is to end up knowing less about the person in question than I did at the start in the way that any good human relationship becomes one where the mystery deepens rather than where you figure the person out. My books are non-narrative, so <laughs> the characters come way second. <laughs> They're more instructional. So you don't have to be all about character. You can be about... Uh, giving people directions. But then you build characters doing those directions that you give them. So uh, all my characters are me and my brother, basically, taking directions and giving directions. My characters, actually, I forgot to mention, they often start out just as images. Like, you know, I'll see a lion at the zoo. I remember seeing a lion and his tail reminded me of a paintbrush, so I had this idea for the story of a lion who painted or... Or, I don't know, I always used to make the hair on my paper dolls last when I was a kid, and sometimes they would blow away before you could put the hair on, before I could put the hair on. So <laughs> that's pretty much actually how my characters, I think, start, just by looking at something. Or the puddle, I look at a puddle and it reminds me of a story or a character. So mine are pretty visual. Uh, there are a lot of writers in the audience, and I'm one of them. I, I'm over here. Hi. Uh, and my latest kids' book was going to be published uh, probably about a year and a half ago. It then went to 2014, <laughs> back down to 2012 now. We're doing OK. But these are tough times for many writers. I'm probably one of them. How are you guys doing? 